things. So what we're talking about today is the psychoneurology of design to grow your complementary medical business. Um, I think this is a really fascinating topic. Um, I really do. I, I just think that, uh, quite honestly, it's one of these things that it's really great if we can get our heads around it. Um, the question really with the psychoneurology of design is, is it an art or is it a science? Well, I, I think actually falls um, in both of those camps. Um, today, obviously, what you're going to learn is about uh, neuromarketing, how our brains respond to colour, design choices, fonts and more, and how we can harness uh, neuroscience to drive buying decisions. Now, I'm going to talk about jargon and words that I will be using in this presentation because this presentation actually straddles the world of complementary medicine and marketing and sales and obviously design and, and so on as well and, and neuroscience so it's kind of a bit uh, it's a bit kind of multifaceted so I'll be using certain words in certain ways but I, I will just sort of describe in a moment just what kind of what those words that I'm using are kind of translating to for our industry. Um, we'll also be discussing uh, logos what they can really mean and things to hold in mind when creating a logo and actually whether or not you, you really do need one at all. Um, there are questions about that, so we will be covering that off further towards the end. Um, obviously, they are hugely important. Design is hugely important. Logos, fonts, colours on page positions and things like above the fold, I'll be telling you what that is and why it's so important, is a huge advantage to you. Things like eye tracking, harnessing lessons from big data, and much, much more um, will help you to establish subliminal messages about your brand and to drive brand recognition, purchasing decisions, loyalty, and to create avid fans who will ultimately fly your, fa your flag, which is of course what we want. So one of the things we have to realize is that 90% of buying decisions are made subconsciously. So what do I mean by buying decision? Well, actually, in our case as practitioners, or, and I know that there are some people in the group who are running training schools and colleges, or if you did my online course on how to set up online courses, then obviously you, you know, then become part of that uh, school or college cohort as well. Um, so obviously the people who are making these buying decisions, they're either phoning up a practitioner to make an appointment, or they are saying, gosh, I really like the look of this course, yes, bang and they hit the button to purchase so that's a buying decision in our field um, human beings process visuals 60,000 times faster than text that's why it's important to include meaningful pictures in your content now I'm going to belabor this point because if you were in the group last week you uh, will remember that we were talking about the emotions in branding and how the big brands out there really know how to harness um, emotions and how to tug at our heartstrings so that we make a neurological and emotional connection to their brand and ultimately they can get us to do what they want us to do. So up to 70% of the time we struggle to get customer attention both offline and online. The field is absolutely saturated out there. Um, so what, we'd want to, what I'm wanting to do with you today is to talk about ways that, we, that I can help you to think about your branding. Um, so logos, websites, brochures, business cards, everything that you have, with, you know, all of your brand assets everything you, you use to get yourself out there and seen, how to create a cohesive message with all of that so that people actually go, gosh, I recognize this, I respond to it, okay, this is, this is speaking my language, this person's part of my tribe, this is a person I want to actually work with in whatever way. So let's, I, I said I promised I would decipher jargon. Okay, so um, what I was going to say is customers, clients, patients, students, as I said at the top there, the people in this group, sorry, I've just inadvertently pressed a, one second, why is that not moving forward? Okay, that's kind of weird. Right, so what I said right at the very top was that um, I would be using jargon like brands, customers, logos, and so on. When I'm talking about customers 
or your target market. Some people in complementary medicine sort of think, oh no, but they're not customers, you know, they're patients or they're clients or what have you. When you boil it down, what we're actually talking about um, is marketing. So I will be using marketing speak. I'm sorry if that offends anybody. Um, if it does offend you, you might not be in the right place at the moment. <laughs> I'm sure actually it's not offending anybody. I think you know where I'm coming from. You know where my heart is in all of this. Um, so when I use words like um, customers, customer base, target market and so on, um, the people that I'm talking about are clients, potential clients, or students, potential students, or if you have uh, products uh, that you're selling into this market, let's say you have aromatherapy products or homeopathic products or energetic medicine products or uh, um, chiropractic uh, couches, for example, um, all of those things are products that, so, so, so ultimately you have a market, you have a target market, you have a client, you have somebody ultimately at the end of the day who we want to buy your products. We want that energetic exchange of money for the service or the product. Um, so I'll be talking about your brand. Um, your brand is your business. It might be your school or college. It might just be your practice. It might be a mixture of both. So we want to get very, very clear about that, you know, the use of that word brand. So that's what that pertains to. And as I said earlier, purchasing decision, that's where the person says, oh gosh, this person really, I really resonate with this person and their message and the way they're putting it across. I'm going to phone up and make an appointment or I'm going to book an appointment online or I'm going to say, yes, I want to buy this course or yes, I want to buy this product. That's purchasing decision. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So let's look about, uh, let's talk about something called neuropsychological coherence. Um, today we're going to look at how, how you can use neuromarketing in your communications with existing and potential new clients to improve your brand visibility, um, to increase your message uptake, um, instigate purchasing decisions and create brand loyalty. That's where a person really loves what you do and they don't just keep coming back to you, but they will also be your, your flag flyers. They'll be telling other people about you. Remember, your logos and visuals must be designed to evoke specific emotional responses. If you didn't see the presentation last week, I strongly suggest you go and, and actually view that one as well, um, uh, sort of after this one perhaps, because I used some examples of advertising, really popular advertising, and explained, and we, we, we kind of deconstructed those and reverse engineered them so we could understand exactly what the um, ad agency or the creative agency was doing in those and how we can harness those for our benefit as well. In addition, your content marketing efforts, whether it's your blog or your newsletter, must always attempt to establish loyalty among your customers, your clients, your students or whomever. So neuroscience, let's look at that. Why does the brain matter in branding? What's it all about? Well, Professionals in the branding industry use the current understanding of human motivation and behaviour to create products, services, logos and campaigns that appeal to the perfect customer. Demographics, psychographics, geographics, behaviours and more. So what do I mean by the perfect customer? Well, if you are in Jamie Goddard Masterclasses, that's my private Facebook group, it's free to join, please do go and, and get stuck in there. Um, on um, on the side, if you're on a computer, on the side you'll see things like files, videos and so on, there's a little drop down list. Um, I've got loads and loads of videos in there and loads of worksheets there for you to be able to understand and identify, uh, work through a little blueprint to figure out who your ideal or perfect customer or client is. Okay, so I strongly suggest you take a look at that. And I'm more than happy actually to do a, one of these sessions on ascertaining um, who your avatar is. We, we use the term avatar in marketing because uh, the avatar is, is, is an ancient, I think it's an ancient Indian uh, phrase actually, that describes the, a, a, an, a sort of an identity in a way. So in market, marketing speak, they use the term avatar to mean a person, an entity that you've conjured up who actually, in, for the purposes of this discussion, represents your absolutely most perfect dream client that you would absolutely always love to work with. And there are certain strange facts about avatars, and that is that they um, are tremendously useful to us in marketing, and that if we can identify them, we can then hold 
conversations with that person. I don't mean real conversation, but you can actually create all of your marketing assets to be able to appeal to that one particular person. And once we do that, what you'll find is that the people like them will also respond to your message. So neuroscience studies the cognitive and affective responses of human beings. It focuses on analyzing how the brain responds to certain stimuli. In the case of the neuropsychology of branding or neuromarketing as it's sometimes called, the focus is on finding out how the brain and our thoughts, desires and so on respond to particular stimuli in marketing. And big brands spend billions on neuromarketing. The more we can learn about our customers from a scientific perspective, the more we can um, add to our marketing campaigns and adv advertising strategies to appeal to precisely the right group and minimize budgetary waste. So what I don't want us doing is going out there and, and twiddling with this and twiddling with that and designing this website and finding it doesn't work and then designing that website and finding it doesn't work either. So we can learn a lot from the absolute big boys, the experts out there. You've already used neuroscience marketing without knowing it, I would wager. If you have created avatars, demographics, if you've ever played with things like lookalike audiences on Facebook, if you haven't pl um, played with lookalike audiences, Audiences yet. Um, we will come on to that at some point in the not too distant future um, with another, another training because it's quite complex uh, but I think we should look at Facebook advertising at some point and actually so let's broaden it out social media advertising. Um, you know I know there are some people in the group that absolutely despise Facebook for very very good reasons but you know these things they're just tools so don't get emotional about them, just remember that they are there for you to use. And a lot of work has been done by very, very clever people to enable us to advertise to our perfect target markets. And they really understand how to harness um, the, the advantage of neuroscience. So every time you look at your marketing plan, if you have one, or you develop a strategy intended to improve your customer experience or boost your brand recognition, you should consider the neuropsychological impact of your message. The tech has filtered down, is now available to us all. Some marketers use eye tracking tech and data analytics for a stronger insight into the big data that supports neuroscience marketing. Um, I'm sure you, you know big data is uh, where marketers and and others um, are able because of their financial might to be able to collate data from vast vast fields and crunch it down and analyze it and segment it so meaningful data come out at the other end it's great like one of those great big sort of uh, um, sausage factory things you know where something goes in there and, and it chugs through and it chugs through and, and this is what comes out at the end and it actually means something so it's research like this that has shown us that that we prefer looking at human faces over text, for example, and that we prefer rounded shapes over pointy shapes, and that certain colors and sounds, even textures, all of these influence our buying decisions. One of the things that I think is branding genius, excuse me while I have a sip of tea. It is tea, not vodka. <laughs> I saw a great meme the other day, actually, um, where this lady went to great lengths to tear a, a tea bag tag off and she stuck it on her cup with it hanging out and then she, she made sure it wasn't going to go anywhere. And then she poured a load of vodka into her cup and was very sort of and, and doing a work meeting, a work Zoom, as we are all down in, in lockdown now with, uh, with her lovely alleged cup of tea, which was neat vodka. And I thought, yeah, where'd you go, lady? <laughs> it was, just really made me laugh, really tickled me. Bear with me one second. It's been very, very dry today. Um, I'm down in Hastings and uh, I don't know quite what's going on, but it's really, really, really dry. So, yeah, I was just going to say one of the um, branding things that I think is incredibly clever is the Apple unboxing experience. Um, I don't know if anybody in the group has Apple products. I would probably imagine quite a few of us do or have had them at some point. But Apple have made an absolute art form about the unboxing experience, even down to the sounds that the boxes make when you actually take them, uh, you know, pull them apart and so on. And the actual texture of the boxes is very, very important. It's a very silky kind of uh, texture that implies luxury but innovation and so on. It's not incredibly clever. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to move on from that and talk about colour psychology. I'm sorry that this uh, slide, actually now it's really blown up large on my really big computer here. Um, I've got a massive, massive um, uh, Apple computer myself and it's actually a little pixelated so I do apologise for that but uh, I hope that it will get the, the point across uh, with all of those different words. Um, so this is just a snippet of uh, colour psychology. Uh, you can go online and you can find lots and lots of this kind of information and it's all pretty cohesive most people actually seem to agree uh, to, as, as to what these actually these colors actually mean um, color of course can be a very powerful tool in your branding decisions countless companies have used color to incredible effect for example cool blue is the best hue for conveying professionalism and um, on the other hand red and yellow are more likely to provoke hunger and in fact they do and in fact research was done in children um, and coming on to this uh, at the end of the, pre the presentation but just to mention it now when you show a child um, red and yellow uh, the set the brain centers for hunger actually light up because it's associated of course with McDonald's and Burger King um, another thing that was found was uh, so much of this research, you can really geek out on it actually, I, I have to say I've had so much fun putting this together. Men wearing red tops were found to be more attractive on dating sites. So I know we've only got a small sample size, but if you suddenly think I look a lot more attractive, it's only because I'm wearing a red top and it wasn't, it was literally the first thing I could grab out of the, the wardrobe today. So this is a great picture here, colour in motion. Now I'm sure many of you will have seen this uh, graphic. Um, it just looks at the colours as we go down um, on the left side here, different colours and then the different brands uh, curving over and you can see that they are all American brands so of course um, you know some of them we are familiar with here in the UK and some of them, some of them we're not, for example Best Buy I don't think is a brand here in the UK. Um, if memory serves. I think I've only seen it in the USA, but I may, may be wrong with that. Um, and so you can see the way that, uh, that different brands use different colouring. And then ultimately, when you've got rainbow dick brands that use lots of different colours, they are signalling diversity. So you'll see NBC, Google, eBay, and so on. Um, so I think it's actually quite an interesting thing to look at. And so it just really brings home the fact that Branding is so intentional, nothing happens by accident. Uh, this is, it, you know, it's all done for a very, very good reason. So let's talk about ad efficiency. Neuroscience marketing has allowed us to tap into the benefits of imaging and big data, as I said earlier, to provide insights into consumer habits. Everything from clicks and conversions to likes on social media can represent important information about how your brand is successfully interacting with your customers. So if you just look at uh, these brands, for example, YouTube, um, well, we kind of know now that the uh, icon to play something is a forward-facing arrow, um, which is, you know, so, so we know that YouTube is something that you can click play and a video will play, but it's in a red background, so that's exciting, that's conveying the fact that it's exciting, and um, also that it's moving forward, it's, it's, it's uh, the trajectory of the brand is moving forward, because uh, most people, not everybody, but most people's timelines run from left to right. So generally speaking, and this isn't, as I said, isn't true for everybody, but um, those of us familiar with things like NLP know that most people's past is sort of represented on the left side, the future is sort of represented on the right hand side. So that is by far the majority of people. So that's why they have chosen to use a forward pointing, we say forward pointing because it seems to, as we look at it, point towards our future direction. Um, on the Facebook um, advertising logo, you've got a little thumbs up, a like, okay, we, you know, if something's good, we go, yeah, okay, it's good, or yes, I can hear you, or yes, it's all okay, yeah, that's fine. So that thumbs up is such a clever little icon because it has so many values associated with it uh, from a neurological and feeling perspective. So it's quite, uh, quite clever how these things are done. Neuromarketing drives the algorithms behind Facebook, Instagram and YouTube ads and we thankfully don't have to conduct humongous big data studies ourselves to benefit, thank goodness, because that would be rather expensive. 
So let's talk now about neuroscience marketing. How do we build trust in our brands? So just a reminder, our brands are our practices, our schools, our products, okay? All of the wonderful things that we do in complementary medicine to help more people. Um, the one thing I don't, I didn't write in, the, in, in this presentation, but something I just want to flag, and it's happening even more now in shutdown, is that there are an awful lot of scams out there. The internet is rife with scams, as we know, and you've got people phoning you up left, right and centre saying, oh, I'm from BT and you're, you know, things overdue and, you know, just uh, give me your bank details and, no, I don't think so, sunshine, off you go. And these scamsters and fraudsters are getting more and more and more sophisticated. So now more than ever is it important to build trust. This is huge, this issue. If neuroscience has always been lurking in the background of good branding, why are so many marketers starting to jump on the neuroscience bandwagon today? Simply, it's because we now have more tools available to us. Advances in data analytics and technology have introduced a brand new word for brands. For example, cookies have created footprints for customers that allow brands to gain better, better access to real-time data about browsing and viewing and purchasing habits. We can even retarget adverts to very specific audiences. We can market to look-alike audiences and more. So what I'm saying is that I don't think that there's anything wrong with using these tools that have come out of neuroscience and big data that the big boys have actually put together for us. Of course, yes, we are paying them money to use their advertising platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, wherever your target market hangs out. Um, that's another thing actually that we should do another time. Um, if somebody just wants to make a note of this, it's just suddenly struck me and we haven't covered this off. Um, at some point, would you like, let me know if you, I'm sorry, uh, presumptuous of me, but would you like us to have a chat, a tutorial, um, doesn't have to be the entire thing, but a talk about where our target markets hang out online and how to know whether you should be using Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, um, Google Ads uh, and, and the rest because it's quite sophisticated and there are some really good ways of actually finding out who your demographics are, their age, their uh, countries, their income levels, what time they're online and so on. If that appeals to you and you'd find it useful, make a note and let me know, okay, because I haven't included any of that in this presentation because this presentation is quite a big one anyway. So um, we can create, as I said, we can create lookalike audiences and more. Um, and retargeting. So for example, if you had run a Facebook ad, just to explain um, retargeting, um, if you run a Facebook ad and you set it out to a particular uh, group of people that you'd identified using the very sophisticated metrics that Facebook allow you to use, um, and certain people responded to the ad, well that's great, and you were very confident that the ad was working, you didn't need to tweak it, then you can actually resend it out, but only to those people who didn't respond to it previously. And you can start to build up really fantastic intel about as to who is responding to your messages and who isn't, and then you can start to understand why you can then start to tweak your messages. So, and you can do all this incredibly inexpensively. Okay, so hopefully that's useful. Now, as I said earlier, we're really competing for, for attention. Attention is such a precious commodity. Um, this, uh, this piece in Ad Age that I found for you, in fact, uh, when I was putting this presentation together, I actually pulled data, collated data from 75 different uh, branding and research uh, sources, some more more commercial like Ad Age, and uh, and various um, uh, you know advertising magazines and and sites, and others were far more PubMed geeky research, uh, science research date based. So I kind of distilled all of that for you. So I just wanted to say there's more content online today than ever before. That means that we brands have to work infinitely harder to capture the attention of our target audience. According to research that I found on Google, about 50% of ads don't even get any recognition at all. That means you run an ad and it just straight over the per they, the person doesn't even register the fact that they've even seen your ad. It used to be said in marketing that a person needs to see a, an ad seven times 
or have seven touch points. So that means they'll have seen something about you online. They'll have seen a poster in a local um, health food store, for example. They'll have seen something perhaps in one of the um, industry magazines. They may well have received a, an email newsletter for you. You need seven touch points. All of those things are touch points. You need seven touch points before somebody will actually notice that you are advertising or, or that you're there for them and that you are a potential resource for them. So what I'm going to say is don't just feel that you can get away with one or two um, efforts. You, you, this needs to be a concerted effort on your part. So what can we do about all of that? Successfully um, harness neuroscience to build your brand. I'm going to just have a sip before we get into focusing on emotion. Oh gosh, I do like a cup of tea in the afternoon. There's nothing quite like it. My, 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 my tea of the day is um, a mixture of green and black tea and it's very refreshing, <laughs> I have to say. So emotions, as we know from last week, um, are essential to effective marketing. When you combine your brand with emotion, you appeal to the subconscious mind of your customer. Think about how you can visually appeal to your consumers on a more emotional level. Visual stimuli work best. And I just made a little note there uh, for the NLPers here. Visual, auditory and kinesthetic. Now, ideal, um, sorry, ideally when you are marketing, the idea is that you should be able to hit uh, the, you know, the, the person's um, I suppose modes are in, in all ways. Um, the majority of people out there tend to respond uh, to visual stimuli the most. That's the most frequent uh, way of, of being in the world. There are some people who are more auditory, so they will use terms like, oh, I like the sound of that, or, oh yeah, that rings a bell. Whereas visual people will say, gosh, yes, I see what you mean, and all oh, that looks really good to me, and so on and so on and so forth. You know, again, we're not going to go into that hugely. There are, of course, also kinesthetics, all oh, that feels I like the feel of that or oh, I'm not feeling so good today or uh, uh, yeah we can, uh, we can talk about touch points that's a really kinesthetic type of word so again um, great marketers can harness all of those elements obviously if you're putting together a website that's very much all about visual stimuli but my strong suggestion to you is that if your website, you think of it as your shop window, you must, must, must include video of yourselves. And I really strongly suggest you harness YouTube as well, set yourself up with a YouTube channel. Again, if you would like me to, I can do a video on that, um, if that's something that appeals to you, if you don't have a YouTube channel already. Um, so the reason for doing that is because you've got, you're ticking two boxes there. The first is the fact that people will be able to see you and the second is they'll be able to hear you and that will help them to understand whether you are the kind of person that they resonate with and that they can work with. People respond, as I said, more readily to images because sight is one of the initial senses that we develop as we grow. We begin to assign emotional meaning to images. Now, obviously, for people who are partially sighted or blind, that doesn't apply if they've been partially sighted with severe sight challenges or blind since birth. Um, in that case, they are more likely to be auditory or kinesthetic. Um, use visual neuroscience in everything from your logo to your online content and you'll trigger more consistent emotional responses from your consumers, improving brand recognition, brand loyalty and brand buying decisions. So also the other thing that we need to do in order to harness neuroscience within our marketing is to think about pricing. If you've ever wondered why a lot of products are priced with numbers like uh, 39995 rather than 400, it all comes down to neuroscience. We know logically that the numbers are very close, but our subconscious sees these numbers very differently, of course. Um, there's far less resistance, by resistance, when something is priced at uh, 39995 rather than 400. It's, it's only 5p difference, but it just makes that little kind of, you know, by pricing at 400, you're just putting that that mental barrier in your way where you don't need to have it. Um, a lot of marketers use what we call in, in marketing uh, terms magic numbers which are 49.95 or 197 or 1997 uh, for price points uh, because again those play well uh, from a subconscious perspective. People feel that it's coming in under that barrier number. 
So a cost can trigger an immediate pain response. Um, and actually in the brain, pain centers light up if they actually see a price point that is not something that appeals to them. So it actually physically hurts. Well, it, it doesn't physically, it mentally hurts. It, it, it uh, the, you know, that the brain perceives it as being painful. And the lower the price seems, the better we feel about it. Now, the caveat to that is, unless you are reassuringly expensive. Remember, we spoke about that with Chanel, and of course, reassuringly expensive is the tagline for um, Stella Artois. Sorry, it just went out of my brain. Stella Artois, reassuringly expensive. And I really want you to bear in mind that the cheapening of your brand can commoditize it. So please beware when you're setting prices. Uh, the thing I always tend to tell people if they're saying, you know, I'm just not busy enough, um, I'll, I will always tend to ask, well, what exactly, you know, what exactly are you charging? I'll find out what they do, where they're located and what they're charging. And I will probably actually advise them to put their prices up. And I have to say, I mean, don't forget, as, as president of the Complementary Medical Association, I have looked after practitioners and practices and training schools and people within the complementary medical field for over, spanning over three decades. The CMA opened its doors 20, over 27 years ago now. So I've seen every permutation of practice that there is. Um, the problem I find in the field is that we undervalue what we offer in the main. Not everybody does, I certainly don't, uh, but I know that a lot of practitioners out there, because we're competing with the other big health service provider, which is free at point of service, the NHS, it's very difficult for some people to think, gosh, you know, I, I, I'm going to charge XYZ decent amount of money for my services. Now, another um, training that I can potentially do for you if, you, if you're interested, let me know, is reverse engineering our pricing structures. And um, so, we, so we can actually ascertain and work down and work through what we should, what we actually need to charge in order to keep a roof over our heads and so on. And how that translates into positioning for your practice. So uh, commoditizing your, your brand means that, let's say you're an aromatherapist and there are six other aromatherapists in your area and you're charging exactly the same as they are and you're going out with exactly the same messages. Well, you're just an aromatherapist. That's all you're doing. You're not offering a, trans, a transformation. You're not offering something really, really unique from your own perspective of absolute expertise. So that's really what I want you to just, I want to plant that little seed in your mind so that you can figure out ways of not commoditizing your offering. That's kind of what we're doing in, in these groups, to be honest with you. People love proof, social proof. My goodness, it is so important in branding. Word of mouth marketing, also known as social proof, is, a, is so effective because customers are constantly looking for proof that they can trust a brand, especially bearing in mind all the scams that are going around. So give your brand extra authority with testimonials, reviews and proof, then you're sure to stand out. Now, what do I mean by proof? Well, yes, I mean, great. You know, if you've got uh, proof that whatever it is that you do actually works by way of published research trials, well, that's absolutely fantastic. But more importantly, actually, um, for the, per the type of person who buys your your service, whether you're a practitioner or a training school, so whether they're buying your service or your courses, um, what they need to know is, do people like me buy this product or service or, or course? We buy from people like us. So this is why it's so important to understand who your ideal market is, um, who your avatar is. Once you understand that, you can actually get testimonials from your existing clients and you can, or students, and then you can actually put those up onto your website, into your brochures, and so on and so forth. If those are, it, if it's very clear that those are from your avatar, your ideal client, it will automatically attract more people like that. Okay, so that's the power of understanding your ideal client. Okay, so. Now we're going to talk about influencer marketing. The ultimate in social proof neuromarketing is where somebody thinks to themselves, I know, I like, I trust that 
that lady that's saying that she's a homeopath and that she looks after people really successfully with my kind of conditions. So that's going back to this idea of people like me. People like me use those services. That really goes a long way into instilling trust in people. And different communities prefer different things. Don't forget that. It's nice to think of us human beings as being one large connected community. But remember that different people respond differently to certain things. To engage your clients, you need to figure out how to make the most of customer preferences, emotions and moods in your neuroscience marketing campaigns. So if you go back to the presentation we did last week, um, remember the, de the, the fairy liquid advert that we looked at and we analysed? It was all about kindness and love and softness. The type of person that that ad was targeted at was mums because mums like to think of themselves and probably should think of themselves as being kind, as being full of love and soft and yielding and nurturing and looking after their little one, as we saw in that uh, interaction between the mum and the little girl and so on. So if you think about your avatar, your person, what is the message that they are going to respond to? What are the emotions that you want that person to actually feel? Research your audience in great detail and find out what's appealing to them uniquely. And remember what we spoke about last week, Pareto's Law. Remember that 20% of your clients will bring 80% of your business. So how do we find out about the kinds of things that these people like? Well, we actually ask them. Have actual real life conversations with those people. Explain that you are looking at ways of building your practice and as they are producing your 80% of your of your business uh, they will be supporting that notion and they will be supportive and and really happy to try to help you find ways of doing that and building your business so these are sort of the sort of people you can actually quite easily talk to and say you know what was it that attracted you to me um, what was it about did you like my website was it you know how did you feel about the website you can actually do surveys that's another thing of course I wouldn't send a survey to um, a member of the public who happens to be your client unless you have said to them first I'm doing a survey may I send it to you no obligation to complete it but it would really help me you can get great surveys for free um, on um, MailChimp survey monkey is another one so I would actually think about putting a cleverly uh, structured survey together um, Neuroscience and marketing, how to use neuroscience in content. Um, so what we've got coming up are just some of the ways that you can use neuroscience online to improve your content marketing efforts. Now, what do we mean by content marketing? Uh, content marketing is where you, as I said, you have various brand assets, your website, um, business cards, letterhead, uh, brochures, and all of those things must, posters even, you, all of those things must be brand cohesive. It must, they must all have the same font, the same logo, same, uh, as we say, type, the same colouring, and so on. Ideally, producing the same emotional response in your target market. Okay. Uh, but what, it, what else is content? Well, content is, of course, information that you have on your website. Perhaps you have articles, perhaps you have a blog. I, I hope you do. Blogs are useful. And um, just making sure that you tag your blog correctly so it can be found by the search engines. Very, very important. Um, if that's gibberish, let me know and we'll do some exploratory work into that as well in the not too distant future. So, uh, content marketing is also perhaps where you might supply information to somebody else's website um, or perhaps you may put posts onto social media whether it's Instagram or whether it's YouTube or whether it's Facebook all of it should have some sort of cohesion perhaps with your logo in the corner or that sort of thing okay so one of the things we have to consistently bear in mind is that not just using wishy-washy emotions we're using a we're, we're trying to engender a visceral response and what what I mean by that is a response that 
people are really, they know that they've had that response. Um, it's really important to make sure that you're appealing to the right emotions. Generally speaking, our brains are more likely to kick into action when we're stimulated by intense emotions like anger, excitement, or even fear. If you can use your campaigns to incite visceral responses, then you'll have better results. Now, I'm going to show you a World Wildlife um, Foundation in a, uh, ad in a moment, but I just want to drill down on that. I personally, because we're talking specifically about complementary medicine, um, there is a school of thought. Of, it, it's very American. And this school of thought is that we need to find the person's fears and pain points and really push on those and emphasize those. Well, you know, what's going to happen to you? You've got this big problem. What's going to happen to you if you don't use my services personally? I don't market in that way. I market. It is effective. It's very, very effective. But personally, I think it's unethical. I personally prefer to market with carrots rather than sticks. I personally prefer to explain to somebody and have them really fully understand, appreciate and emotionally relate to what I'm selling. So for example, with the Complementary Medical Association, our strap line is um, excellence and professionalism. We've just got two words that we use either side of the logo. Um, those actually appeal to practitioners very, very highly because those are our core values are they not? So you will see the CMA logo, which looks very, very beautiful. It's a beautiful logo, very professional. Um, but you'll also see words like demonstrate your, prof your commitment to professional excellence. And those are the sorts of strap lines that we use. Not because we're conning anybody into anything, but this is because this is our core ethos. This is where we're coming from. It's where we've always come from for, for the last over three decades. Um, and we have now, of course, established ourselves as the global leader in the field for these reasons. Um, so professionalism, ethics, um, excellence, and so on and so on and so on. So that's how we are uh, portraying our and, and evoking our visceral response. Um, but let's just look at this World Wildlife um, ad here. It's really ghastly. Stop climate change before it changes you. And you can see a guy that's morphed into a, a fish. Uh, it's not, not um, as far from the truth as we might wonder, uh, because of course, you know, fish, as we know, are starting to be born either hermaphroditic or female because of the levels of PCBs in the oceans that are um, uh, hormone disruptors. Uh, so this is a very, very serious message. It's a very strong advert to produce a visceral response. It's frightening, it's disgusting, let's face it, it works. The visual image is so strange and overwhelming that it fills you with a sense of dread. It's the emotion, negative though it may be, that it inspires us to act. So I'm not saying you should do that in your marketing exactly, but I just wanted to give you an example of ways that organisations can inspire a visceral response. You will also see the same sort of tactics used when you see adverts um, by Oxfam for example and you've got poor little darling babies in Africa and so on who are starving I mean those adverts provoke absolute visceral response uh, so and they do get you know they do drive uh, response in in the way that they they want to so uh, they do those adverts do work thank goodness um, so the other thing that we need to do, um, the flip side of this, is that if we're not going to use something that's frightening to people, and I really don't want you to, appeal to the self-serving instincts of the brain. Um, over time, human brains have evolved to be very self-serving. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're selfish, but that we are focused on keeping ourselves happy and content. There's a great evolutionary drive um, to actually pursue happiness. Um, content that strokes your reader's ego and makes them feel validated can be more positively received. For example, the always like a girl campaign appealed to the desire of women to feel respected and unconstrained. So um, this advert in, in the bottom here, you can run hashtag like a girl, throw hashtag like a girl, swim like a girl, dance like a girl, and the, the, the tag with, with a hashtag is, what do you do? Hashtag, like a girl. So they're actually asking you to interact and tweet about the sort of things 
that you do as a girl you know what what do girls do and obviously clearly because of the age of these girls it's it's targeted at a particular age group and so on and the idea is that of course um, always are um, are sanitary products and so of course there's this you know received wisdom that uh, suddenly we become in when we have our period we're suddenly incapable of being able to ride a bike or ride a horse or uh, go swimming or anything like that and of course this is what they're saying. The they're saying exactly the opposite. No, you're just the same as you are normally. You're just just menstruating. That's all. No big deal. Very important messages. Um, so next, what we have to do is feed the desire for familiarity. A consistent brand with a strong personality is so powerful. Human beings naturally want to draw comfort from familiar um, interactions. When we recognize a familiar pattern, our brains produce dopamine, which makes us feel better. In the world of marketing, you should aim to produce content that feels familiar in terms of the font, images, graphics, and the colors that you use. So what I'm suggesting you do is not reinvent the wheel. Look at brands out there that you like um, that you feel because of the colour and the shapes and um, possibly even the message. They don't have to be in the field of complementary medicine, but you, there are certain things about them, about the energy of that brand that really appeals to you. Do you remember last week when we deconstructed the CMA logo? We, one of the ideas of the CMA logo um, that when, when we were actually designing it was that we wanted to create the feeling that this is a really solid, established organization that is a re really a force to be reckoned with because that we knew, I, I knew exactly how the CMA was going to develop. I have no idea how I know, it's kind of like it downloaded into my head. Very strange, very metaphysical, I'll tell you about that another day. Um, but what actually happened was that I needed something that would reflect that feeling that I had um, about the CMA. And so again, you, so, so uh, we borrowed from another brand, which was the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, because we happened to have a carrier bag with us. We'd just been there and uh, wandering around the museum. And they had this beautiful, beautiful typography with, uh, with guidelines on it and, uh, and so on. And so there were many, many things about those different things that we borrowed from, of course, uh, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, you know, a fantastic image. Uh, an image that is incredibly popular, people love it, but it symbolizes hum human and, and humanity. So though, what I'm trying to demonstrate there is that all of those things are familiar elements, but we brought them together in a completely new way. So you can do that, go out your homework, should you choose to accept it, your mission is to go out and look at brands that you like for whatever reason, whatever reason it appeals to you, and uh, think about how you can maybe um, take bits and pieces, little guides from those to actually inform your branding and your logo even. We'll come on to logos in a bit. The next thing that you need to think about is for your website, for your brochure, what have you, is to avoid complexity. I often speak about white space. What I mean by that is when you have, let's say, text on a page or text on a website, you need lots and lots of air, also known in, in advertising as air, around the words. This is a beautiful image that I'm showing you at the moment because it's very, very simple, very, very zen. Now, I'm sure that there may well be people sitting there, and I know Roberta, you're going to be one of them, thinking, oh my gosh, yes, but the CMA website is really, really crowded and it's really quite difficult to navigate your way around it. We are totally redesigning the CMA website. When it went up um, eight, eight years ago, it was absolutely all the rage. People were just like, whoa, this site's amazing. Oh my goodness, that's absolutely incredible. It's a new site. There are certain things about the CMA site that are just so groundbreaking, and still are groundbreaking, insofar as the news items update every couple of hours. So it's like a ticker. So it just constantly has new information on it. We do that for various reasons. A, to make the site sticky so that people keep coming back to it, which is really important for our practitioners and um, our training schools and so on everybody that represent that we represent on the site um, our approved suppliers and, and more but uh, the other thing is it helps dramatically with search engine optimization because you've got a site there that is constantly updating so you can please cannibalize it take message it take anything you want from what I'm offering you uh, because this information is given freely for you to use in, in any way that you see fit so 
Clean and clear is good. Although it's important to give your customers plenty of value with your content, you also want to make the brand promotion assets you produce simple and easy to use. After all, anything that the brain perceives as difficult is an immediate turnoff. On your websites, in your brochures, make your content more scannable with bullet points, lists and subheadings. This all reduces complexity and remember, the website building rule is never have your visitor more than two clicks away from where they want to be to find the information they want. It's the two click rule. If they've got to click more than twice, they're going to navigate away from your site and go and find a site that actually works for them. Surprise your reader though. Finally, when you're producing content, it's important to make sure that you're not just churning out the same old words and phrases. So this is about, this is not about design. Don't surprise your, your uh, site visitor with suddenly, oh my gosh, we've got a complete new, new design here, new logo and so on. They'll think, whoa, I thought I was on a different, and they'll navigate away. Uh, but it's, what I'm talking about is the actual content. You've got to use language that keeps the person involved. Um, if you find that you're sort of sliding into jargon, then just be aware of that. Don't use jargon. Think about using carefully chosen high quality images and videos in your blog posts, on your website and so on. Just another word on jargon, by the way. This is a big hobby horse of mine. It's uh, a bit of a pet peeve, so I will just tell, tell you this now. Um, because in complementary medicine, we are absolute experts in our fields, um, we tend to slip into jargon. So for example, I might talk about homeopathy, I might talk about miasms, I might talk about things like um, succussion, um, I might talk about potentization, I might talk about SACLAC. Um, all of these terms that are shorthand and perfectly acceptable within the world of homeopathy, but mean absolutely blooming nothing to anybody else who isn't homeopath um, or isn't married to a homeopath or what have you. So um, please be aware, you know, uh, you're a massage practitioner, don't talk to me about um, effleurage and, and, uh, and, and various other techniques because, you know, all I want to know is, how is what you do going to make me feel? Are you going to fix me? Are you going to fix my woe, my, my problem? What's the transformation you're, you're promising? That's really all I want to know. Do you remember last week we spoke about what's in it for me? If you can answer that question, that's always a fantastic thing. Always, always go back to emotion. We're now going to talk about visual neuroscience, how your brain sees branding. Now, of course, we've already touched on important visuals and how important they are to neuroscience and marketing. Um, while all the best brands are multidimensional, complex and designed for longevity, it's important to remember that your visual identity, such as your font, logo, brand man manual, if you have one, can be improved when you understand about how the human brain works. Now, just to go back to that first section there, it says, while all the best brands are multidimensional, complex, and designed for longevity, what that means is that over the years, you know, the real big brands, Coca-Cola, American Express, um, IBM, and so on, they've all had different brand identities through the years. If you looked at their marketing and their advertising over the years, you'd see, gosh, it actually makes quite a complex picture as they've entered new markets, as they've identified um, other messaging that they can get out. So those brands, when you look at them in the gestalt, are quite complex. But that doesn't mean to say that you should make your messaging complex. That's the, it is the opposite of what I'm trying to say there. Okay, keep it simple. So how exactly does the brain see branding? Okay, uh, human beings love familiarity. Almost 50% of the brain is made up of visual processing power. It's the fusiform gyrus. So when a client sees your logo or tagline, their eyes send a signal along the fusiform uh, gyrus, which is this, or this uh, yellowy bit here at the bottom of the brain. Um, it's part of the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the human brain. The fusiform gyrus plays several key roles in human visual processing and recognition, including facial recognition and differentiating familiar objects from one another, like the difference between a cat and a dog. Certain neurons in this part of the brain also appear to be involved in our high level recognition of words, numbers and colours. I also want to touch on something else very, very relevant, and that's neuroplasticity. 
the more you give your brain um, the same experience with a consistent brand message and image, the more familiar it becomes. This is why it's so important for brands to remain tr uh, true to their visual identity for as long as possible. So while you may, so for example, going back to the CMA, what we're doing at the moment is, of course, we are keeping our logo in exactly the same that it's, as format that it's always been. We have added a little ribbon at the bottom of the logo, which you may have noticed. It says uh, 1993 to, uh, to uh, 2020 and then 27 years. Um, so that, it, that actually is an appeal to the fact that, yes, we've been around for a really, really long time. Um, and so that's the only change that we've made to our logo since its inception back in 1990. The, the logo was created 1991 or two because of course we created everything and did all the research before we actually opened the CMA doors for membership in 1993. So it's been around an awfully long time. Um, so the thing about uh, neuroplasticity is that and, and the way that our brains respond is that keep your brand um, as it is and your logo, if you have one, and we're going to come on to logos later, as it is, but make sure that you are keeping everything clean and clear so that a person's brain, when they view your brand assets, be it your website, your brochure, your business card, and so on, they're still seeing that same message, but keep it clear and uncluttered. That's why it's so important for brands to remain true to their visual identity for as long as possible. So let's talk about the neuroscience of brand coalescence. Um, over time, positive or rewarding or negative disappointing experiences with a specific brand are layered into an overall brand identity profile in our minds. Different brands end up with different profiles and, turn tr and in turn trigger different responses in our brains. In one study, people who saw sports like Nike and luxury like Mercedes brands triggered emotions and brain activity in different places than brands rated as value products like Walmart or Tesco, Tesco, um, GP brand and so on. Um, so the, the way that you, your brand um, and your brand value is, that comes across actually does trigger different parts of the brain, which I think is very interesting. So MRI scans, as we said earlier, is that why is that disappearing? Oh, totally weird. There's a, there's a gremlin in the house. As I said earlier, um, MRI scans of children's appetite and pleasure centers in their brains also show the light up in response to seeing branding from recognizable fast food restaurants like McDonald's, Pizza Hut and Burger King, according to research by University of Missouri, Kansas City and the University of Kansas Medical Center. Therefore, it is possible to argue that the emotional, social and cultural value of brand recognition are capable to activate deep reward circuits, even to a significantly greater extent than generic images, write the researchers at the Laboratory of Clinical Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Pisa in Italy in a second study. This observation further supports the hypothesis of strong emotional relationship between consumer preferences and brands. So a study uh, uh, co-written by Professor Gavin Fitzsimmons at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke found that people who were shown Apple's logo scored 20 to 30% higher on a creativity test than those who were exposed to the IBM logo, presumably because they were mirroring the traits that they associate with those logos. In some cases, particularly strong brand associa associations even make us think differently. So isn't that interesting? IBM is kind of sort of stuck in the mud and a bit, uh, yeah, it's just kind of a bit boring, whereas Apple have kind of messed with our minds. And when we see Apple, we don't know it, but we get excited. Very strange, isn't it? So the branding takeaway um, on this particular section is that research shows that consistent positive interactions with brands creates positive psychological reinforcement when it's encountered. Um, excuse me one second, this is just going a bit wonky here. Let me just take that away. Sorry, I'm just moving something on my screen. There we go. Right, okay. So, um, yes, <laughs> uh, so they create a positive reinforcement when it's encountered. Um, 
various times. And on the other hand, negative experiences can do just the opposite. Brands who deliver consistent high quality experiences across different touch points like retail, social and customer service don't just win hearts, they actually win minds and change how we think. And the MRI scans actually show the way our brains light up um, when we are confronted with different brands. It's so interesting. So for example, uh, blue imagery can help to give a scientific article, for example, more authority by evoking feelings of professionalism, whereas bright colours like orange and yellow can give your brand a sense of overwhelming positivity. Colours, as we know, play a huge part in almost every part of branding and marketing. And your main focus when you're using visual, using visual neuroscience should be deciding how to use colour effectively to give depth to your brand's personality and online presence. So take a look at some of the brands out there, your homework, should you choose to accept it, is to gather, is to get, if you can get hold of magazines or go online and print out um, logos or brand imagery that really resonates with you and just um, just either pin it up on the wall or put it into a little portfolio so that you can go back and you'll start to be able to figure out what the common denominators are in those particular brands that appeal to you and the interesting thing that i have found and i don't know if research exists to support this but i suspect it might and i may well just take a look for it is that very often the avatar that we really want to appeal to is nine times out of ten very similar to us. So the thing that appeals to us is usually the thing that appeals to our avatar or our ideal client. Just interesting food for thought that I'll have to have a you know, little route around in the research to see whether anybody's actually done that work. Excuse me one second. Right. Okay. So let's talk about the use of colour to influence response. The, again, this is kind of very geeky actually, but uh, what I want you to know is that the primary visual cortex, V1 as it's known, understands lines and edges, whereas cells in secondary visual cortex, V2, are interpreting colours and helping to connect short-term visual experiences with longer-term memories. Research suggests that V2 is particularly responsible for how we see colour consistency, which explains why a red apple still looks red if we look at it outside, under a lamp, or in different lighting conditions. We know it's an apple, we know theoretically if it's sort of like got a darker bit on it, it should theoretically be red. It's just kind of our brain does that, that uh, mental gymnastics um, leap. Uh, to, and that's how we associate it. Interesting, I found this so intri intriguing. Interestingly, research from Xerox and Loyola College points to the connection between colour and memory. Seeing a logo in colour makes it 39% more memorable than seeing the same logo in black and white. Colour also drives engagement. Adding colour to blog posts, product guides, print advertising and other brand collateral increases readership by 80%. I mean, that is not to be sniffed at. If you, just by slapping some colour on your page and creating a colour logo or a colour identity, you are going to get so much more interaction and engagement with whatever it is that you're putting out there. So please, you know, utilise colour big time. Visual mapping is also very important. Um, understanding the impact of things like uh, depth, colour and movement on the brain can also help us design more cohesive experience. Experiences for brands like ours that drive consumers towards specific goals. So what I mean by that, we're driving, let's say, for sake of argument, a potential new client to your website in order for them to learn about you and then pick up the phone or click online to make an appointment to see you. That's a specific goal. Or we are engaging somebody who's a potential student to drive them to your website to, to enable them to learn about you and to click to buy your course or to enroll on your course and so on. Understanding how your user's eyes move across the page and which elements they recognise first can help us create websites and visual images online that draw attention to things like calls to action, also um, shortened to CTA, prompting stronger engagement and response Calls to action are things like click here for more information, buy now, um, find out more, learn more, um, contact me. 
Uh, it, it's telling people what to do. That's a call to action. You tell them what to do and they do it. So the other thing that I want you to bear in mind, again, thinking about eye tracking and so on, is making sure when you design your website that all of your most important elements are what we call above the fold. Originally, a newspaper editorial or advertising term uh, referring to the upper half of the front page above the fold in terms of its immediate and optimal viewing position. So if you can imagine, I don't have, I don't actually have a newspaper in here, well I probably have, but not one I can actually get my hands on. So if you can imagine, hold the front page, that used to be the advertiser, the, the uh, newspaper man thing, didn't it? you know, in those old black and white movies, hold the front page! And uh, so, you know, and it would be, it might, you know, the big story goes on the front page. Where on the front page does that big story go? Don't, don't forget that newspapers used to be broadsheets and they used to be folded, didn't they? Well, quite honestly, if you didn't put your big breaking story on the above the fold section, so it's actually literally, as the person looks at the newspapers, they can see the story there. That's what's called above the fold. So on your website, as you know, people come to your website and the bit that they initially see is called above the fold. Anything they have to scroll down or yeah, scroll down to look at that comes up the page is below the fold. So you need your most important um, assets above the fold. It includes your logo if you have one a call to action if you have one. So for example, the new CMA website, we're going to be putting the um, one of our most important assets so that we can communicate with people is the CMA e-newsletter. So we're going to be putting the sign up for the newsletter top left because when people eye tracking, um, in, um, eye tracking uh, analysis, uh, they, they, put, um, they put either cameras in front of you that are able to track your uh, pupils or they will actually put a headset on you that actually tracks your eye movement. Very very clever stuff. It looks positively medieval but actually it's just very very, it doesn't hurt anybody, it's just very clever. So a person's eyes, if they are um, from a western culture where we usually, most of us, and very few exceptions, read from um, left to right. Okay, so that's why if you're working uh, with in English, for example, a website would tend, because we read from left to right, to have the most important information top left, followed by ideally your logo smack bang in the middle, and then things like uh, one of the, the conceits is the search. I say conceits meaning the usual, it's not conceited, conceits, the, the usual habit for web designers based on research is you then tend to find that people have the search to the search space, the search bar um, on the upper right, uh, right hand side. Now I appreciate that you're looking at me and I'm probably really confusing you because I think that we've got a mirror image. So I think I'm saying my left hand side and you're probably seeing this coming up as your right. So I do apologize, but you know, listen to my words. Just don't look at, don't look at me. If you can, if you can see me, that is at all at the moment anyway. I'm not sure where you've just got the uh, presentation on screen. So we're also going to just quickly talk about fonts because fonts is a full tutorial in and of itself. And when well, I promise I will give you at some point. Um, when it comes to choosing visual neuroscience elements for your brand, remember that the use of specific fonts and styles can have a direct impact on the number of people that visit your website. First, we're going to look at the two fonts that you should never, ever, ever use. If I ever find you using these fonts, you are going to have the biggest smack bottom ever. So please, please just pay heed and know that you don't want me coming around your house and sorting that, that all out. What I want to say is certain typefaces, of course, work with different professions, choose fonts that match your brand message well. Okay, so the first naughty font that none of us are ever going to use, are we, ever, is, you'll see the words professional practice written. That, that, and then next is Comic Sans, that's the name of that font. Professional practice, that to me that font does not convey the message professional practice. It's sort of comic book script. Um, nah, it's not, it's not conveying the message. The next one that's even worse, and these are the two most hated fonts out there by, by font designers and, and researchers. This one is called Bradley Hand. It is a handwriting font, but the problem is it doesn't really join up and it really looks 
artificial. You can get some handwriting fonts that look really realistic. Um, and there are times, for, for example, if it was a very highly legible handwriting font, there is an argument that you could use that for your testimonials. If you're putting testimonials online or in your brochures, you might want to use a handwriting font because again, it provokes a visceral response because it implies that that font has, that that uh, uh, testimonial has come from a real person, which of course it has. You don't make testimonials up. That's absolute rule number one. Um, talking just briefly about testimonials, if you use a testimonial, ideally, well, if you're using a testimonial, rule number one, never use a testimonial without asking the person's permission first. Get it in writing. It also explained to the person, should they ever wish you to remove their testimonial, it will be removed immediately. So those are the first couple of things that you must bear in mind. The second thing is, ideally, if you can get the person's name and uh, location, great, that's wonderful if you can do that, if they're happy for you to do that. If they will allow you to put a picture up of them, even better. That is the most highly performing form of testimonial, one that is in the person's own words, with a picture of the person, um, ideally before and after picture, if you have that kind of a, a, a work where you can show a transformation physically. Let's say somebody who's a personal trainer could do that, for example. Um, uh, let's say somebody who's working uh, with skin conditions. Let's say somebody had really bad eczema, and then you can show before and after where the eczema has completely cleared up. Now, another tutorial for another day is talking about what we can talk about as far as medical claims are concerned and what we can't. If that's one that appeals to you, let me know. I've got so many ideas and options for you, but this is such a massive, massive topic. Um, complementary medicine and how we can get the message out there to people is a huge topic. So both of these, um, Comic Sans and Bradley had never ever use them, please, pretty please, with bells on, okay? So we're getting slightly better. Professional practice, um, the next one coming up, looks a bit more professional. It's in a font that I really like. This is actually one of my most favourite fonts. It's called Gil Sands. Um, it's the font that is used by the London Underground, and you can actually see that. Now you're looking at the words London Underground, you can say, oh yeah, actually I recognise that. I recognise it. It's just that font. It's called Gil Sands. And finally, one that, and it's not finally actually, um, Last week we spoke briefly about using serif fonts and sans serif fonts. So if you look at Gil Sands, it hasn't got any twiggly bits like Baskerville does. Um, so online, on screen, uh, sans serif fonts like Gil Sands without the twiggly bits are far more easy to read. They have better response. In printed and written material, serif fonts like Baskerville or Times New Roman, which is a really good one, uh, use that for, your, um, for, for increased legibility in printed material. It really does make a massive, massive difference. Um, not just legibility, but also credibility, which is also very interesting. And then for titles, uh, the CMA titling is something called Perpetua Titling Light. Um, and what I do uh, with this is that we, we spread out, we stretch it as well. So that if you look at where it says professional practice on that last line, you'll see that there are, there's quite a lot of air, to use a fancy marketing term, between the letters. So I've deliberately spaced out the letters just fractionally, only by, only by 1.2 points, but it makes a difference between it being just a word and being part of an identity. Now, I'm not saying that you should use those last three fonts at all. Um, in fact, you probably wouldn't want to, but the sorts of fonts you can pick from, uh, from for things like sans serif fonts include um, Helvetica, uh, you could Verdana is another one that does actually work and render very well on screens. It's highly readable on screens. So I would certainly plump, we use a lot of Verdana ourselves on the CMA uh, website and will be um, continuing to use Verdana on the new CMA website because it renders well across different platforms. What I mean by that is whether somebody's looking at that, that written, those written words on a computer screen 
or a phone or a tablet, it renders well across all of them and it stands up to different email delivery services as well. So I would strongly suggest to you that Verdana may be one you'd want to look at. And then um, I would probably suggest to you, maybe if you're written um, brochures and so on, you might want to look at a serif font like ideally probably Times New Roman if you want to make a note of that. Um, and then lastly, remember um, to increase impact. If you are making bullet lists, bullet points, um, perhaps bold the bullet point and then your writing, your explanatory writing underneath is just in normal weight um, or even a lighter weight font. Ensure you stay consistent throughout all of your online platforms. Very, very, very important. So whether you are putting something up on uh, YouTube or Facebook or um, Instagram or your blog, um, your website and so on, make sure that you have consistency, it's hugely important. So just a few more tips for neuromarketing. Everything you do online affects the perception of your company, your product and your identity. By now, you, of course, you already know the basics of neuroscience and marketing. So here are some more key tweaks, just finally, that could help you to enhance your neuromarketing potential. Your content should always be branded, as I just said. Design influences your reader um, or your website visitor, and it can have an impact on your credibility too. Research shows that people do process advertising, even if they don't consciously think about it. It's important to provide a consistent branded experience on every channel and platform. So think about adding branded images to your social posts, using the same profile image across all platforms, inserting your logo if you have one, Every, every way you can. Uh, prompt action with images. Online neuroscience shows us that we have around 50 milliseconds to make an impression on our target audience. That means that the images that you use on your website will determine exactly what you represent in the eyes of your audience. Remember, in Western society, reader eyes move from top to bottom and left to right. Make sure that if you use images of people, you direct the gaze of those people to where you want your reader's attention to go. This landing page on lead pages is a great example. So look, um, this is structured for a Western viewer. So the important words, as you look at the lead pages landing page there, uh, is uh, are the number one landing page builder. That's what they do. Um, you'll notice they've got a picture of a lady there. Her eyes are pointing to exactly those words, the number one landing page builder. Okay, so if you're going to use imagery of people, which is just fine, um, then make sure that the imagery that you are using is intentional. So that person, so your important message, the person is looking directly at your important message. Now that's quite subliminal here because we know that this lady is looking at something on a computer, but our eyes don't see that. Our mind hasn't registered that computer really. They've actually registered where she's, at, where she's seeming to look, the number one pay, landing page builder. Focus on making your readers feel more comfortable. Neuroscience marketing can sometimes mean creating subliminal messages subliminal experiences for your audience that pass beyond the normal limits of our perception. We're more likely to accept the opinions of people they believe to be confident. This could mean that using confidence in your writing makes you more believable to your, your customers. <coughs> Excuse me. A good way to display confidence is to make sure that you research your content so thoroughly and use strong words and phrases. Don't say that something might be a certain way. Truthfully tell your customers what you know and make them believe in you. You, after all, are the expert. So what I mean is, um, I mean, I may say, for example, uh, I write the natural anti-aging column for Natural Health magazine. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the time, if I'm talking about something speculative, let's say... Um, Okay, something topical. Let's say that uh, turmeric and its um, active constituent, curcumin, has been shown in many trials to be strongly antiviral. It does perform well against COVID-19. So, no, it performs well against coronavirus. And therefore, we can extrapolate from that that it might perform well against COVID-19. <coughs> 
So what we're doing there is we're actually starting with very, very strong information, really evidence-based information, and we are then going with something might. But it doesn't really matter because you've actually established the fact that you do know what the heck you're talking about just by the, the preamble in that sentence. You are the absolute expert. You know exactly what you do. You know the transformation that you bring to your clients. You know how you benefit them. You know how to explain what's in it for them. Um, and that's the message that you have to get across. So do so with absolute confidence confidence it's hugely important use social <coughs> excuse my voice again use social influence to inspire engagement the cheerleader effect suggests that people are more attractive in groups than in isolation that what the cheerleader effect is is that if you think about um, the in America for example you know they always talk, always talk about the jock and the cheerleader you know the, the girl who's the cheerleader is really attractive you know she's very popular and so on. it's actually the fact is cheerleaders aren't actually more any more attractive than anybody else the fact is they are found in groups cheerleaders go around in gangs don't they together and they're in groups and they do yeah yeah you know rah 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 um, and so you know there's an interesting phenomenon that our brains find people in groups more attractive <clears throat> bizarre as that may sound. This is part of the reason why social media influencers are so effective when it comes to improving drive and engagement for your brand. If you can get people plenty of followers or a large crowd to believe in your brand, then you're more likely to convince new customers that you're a trustworthy company or practitioner or training school or what have you. And <clears throat> you can also use your social media channels to share testimonials and reviews from customers or clients or, or students who've, who've previously interacted with your brand. This will help people who feel unsure about your brand to give more, to, to feel more open about giving you a chance because they are looking at information from people like me. You know, this is, I'm looking at it and going, oh, oh gosh, there goes they're just like those people are just like me I can relate to those people oh they like this brand okay so maybe that brand is something I should be looking at logos coming on to logos now what do they really mean a logo um, the word was first coined by Heraclitus um, it's visual shorthand that's basically what it is we should be able to ex understand exactly what a brand is does and its values it represents in milliseconds this could be obvious or by learned association do you really need a logo? Well, on the side here, we've got various logos um, that are highly, highly effective and highly known. For example, those interlocking C's for Chanel are really ubiquitous, aren't they? I think everybody just you know, automatically knows, knows those. Coco Chanel, um, that stands for. Um, Yves Saint Laurent, Dave and Victoria Beckham, and, and so on. Uh, McQueen, uh, Vivian Westwood, Louis Vuitton. You know, they're all um, really well-known brands. Um, the interesting thing about those brands is that they are all for people's names. So you might not need a logo. Here's the thing. If you are the brand, then quite possibly a picture of you and your name could serve as the visual elements of the brand. In complementary medicine, the know, like and trust factor is hugely important. We buy from people that we know, that we like and that we trust by putting out good, solid information out there that really underpins and underlines your expertise. People will get to know you. They will get to, they will come to like you. Therefore, they will come to trust you and they will therefore buy from you. So um, one of the best ways of doing that is, as I say, by putting video out there so that people can actually really get to know you. They can get to see you. They can get to understand how you interact. We have this available to us. It's completely free. It costs us nothing. There has never been a better time to be alive than now for anybody who has a business, quite honestly. These things are just out there for us to use and to harness. They're mighty, mighty powerful things. So what I'm saying is that you know, we've got all these uh, brand names and they can be incredibly effective. Mr. Lots of people that are sort of brand, made up brand names like Mr. Kipling, Harry Ramsden. Do you remember Silit Bank? Hi, I'm Barry Smith. It's very, very loud. Do you remember? <laughs> I actually went online and Googled who is Barry Smith. I thought he was an actor, but he's a pretend brand. He's a brand ambassador. He's totally pretend. There is no Barry. Well, I'm sure there is a Barry. In fact, I used to know Barry Smith. Not that one, though. Um, there's Mr. Sheen. There's 
Hoover, Biro, Madonna, Pink. We all know what these brands stand for and the name is the brand or logo. So for example, on my, my, uh, my, my flip side, if you like, when I'm not doing my day job of running the Complementary Medical Association, as you know, I'm an author and a broadcaster and I write books and such like. So I have a website and it's simply called janiegoddard.org. So my name and my picture is the brand. Um, so I'm doing it and it is very successful. It's very recognizable. So I'm saying you know it, it does work so if you feel that you don't want to think of a particular design if you don't if you feel you don't really want to think about oh gosh you know uh have i got this right and you're going to like really stress over it don't even go there use your name and think about colors by all means you must bring color um energy emotion and so on all of those still things still stand to reason but you know, you don't have to have an actual picture, an actual um, a logo per se, if you don't want to have one. Um, so the brands are constructed in interesting ways. This poor little baby's going to go, going, you're going to name me what? So, you know, just be really thoughtful if you do decide to go for a brand name. And this is possibly more relevant for training schools and colleges, actually. Um, you want to just think about this little grid here um, where you've got irrelevant and relevant words, uh, that, words that are irrelevant to your brand, but they just happen to be words, words that are highly relevant to your brand. So um, you've then got uh, words that are deviant or descriptive. So a deviant word is Apple or Amazon. Those words deviate from the brand because they have no connection. You know, we're not um, getting an apple through the post when we decide to get an iPad. We're not receiving um, a ticket to canoeing uh, down the Amazon when we buy something from Amazon. Um, but if you want to, you, to, but they are words, they're words that are out there in common parlance. Um, descriptive words uh, that are highly relevant are things like General Motors, Electronic Arts. You kind of know what the, what the organisation does, Complementary Medical Association. We know what the, so, so that, so the CMA is a relevant word type of brand. <clears throat> Non-words are neologistic, neolog neolog so they've literally been made up um, and they're completely new words. So words like Spotify and Kodak um, didn't exist before. They've been created deliberately to, to be part of this uh, brand. Um, or no other non-words that didn't exist before, um, but they are associative. So Facebook, LinkedIn. So Facebook originally used to be the Facebook, and thank goodness they dropped the the, because uh, that made, it was just clunky, wasn't it? It just made no sense. LinkedIn, well, we kind of know what it does. It's, a, it, it's an associative word. It's, it's a non-word, but it is now a word because they've smushed it together and it's now all one word, but we know exactly what it does. So as a marketer, understanding brand associations, whether in your content, logo, if you choose to have one, design elements, associations can lead to powerful insights. When Barry Herstein joined PayPal from American Express to become the brand's CMO in 2007, he started using neuromarketing research to identify what people's most positive association was about using PayPal. The research concluded that PayPal's users most valued was the fact that it was fast. Using PayPal helps you to buy things and transfer money faster than other available options, particularly at the time before Venmo, Square Cash and Apple Pay. When people thought of PayPal, they thought fast transaction. So Herstein launched a global rebranding effort to align this brand closer with a visual identity that communicated speed. So when you go to PayPal, when you log in, it's very clear, it's very obvious what you have to do. There's no decorative bells and whistles, it just is highly functional. So when Herstein changed PayPal's visual and verbal identity across the company's email and web pages, click through and email responses, uh, response rates to the brand's digital messaging increased three to 400%. That is mind blowing in marketing. For somebody to achieve that much uplift on a brand is absolutely nuts. So just by keeping things true to your brand, you can really make huge differences. So in closing, while some brand associations are quite obvious, Apple with smartphones and computers, Google with search, Nike with shoes, branding is processed throughout our brains across memory, emotions, reward centers, self-understanding, social relationships, and even less direct associations. Ultimately, 
All of these identity elements and experiences come to represent your brand. As a marketer, designer or other steward of your brand, the more comprehensively you can understand the full spectrum of what your brand means for your audience, the more effectively you will be able to manage and position it. Most of all, as research shows, there's a difference between what people will tell you they think about the brand and how they subconsciously experience it. So going back to what we were saying last week, don't ask your mum and your dad and your neighbour and your auntie and your friend and your daughter and your son and your cousin about your brand. They are supporting you, so they're going to say, oh, it's lovely, dear. Don't do that, because it won't give you any meaningful data at all. Go to the people who are your brand audience. Ask them. And as I said earlier, if you can send out a survey, so much the better. So thank you for joining me today. All of my contact details are here. Um, I would love to see you in Janie Goddard Masterclasses. I've got loads of really interesting videos and worksheets for you over there. Um, join me in the Complementary Medical Association Facebook page and private members group. Um, that's just for CMA members. Uh, CMA uh, general page is open to everybody. The private members group is just for CMA members. Um, join me at the Complementary Medical Association and, and the Jamie Goddard YouTube channels. Make sure you subscribe to those. There's a little bell icon ne near the subscribe button. Click that so that you get a notification every time we upload new videos. Uh, that's my email address, Jamie at the cma.org.uk, CMA office details here, and of course the CMA website, which I'm sure you all know here. Now, as you know, the CMA, or if you're just tuning in because somebody's very kindly sent you this link, uh, the CMA newsletter comes out every week on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock, unless something really bizarre happens and there's some late breaking news that we have to get to in, so we maybe shunt it back slightly later. Um, what I was going to say about that is you can sign up for the CMA newsletter if you don't already get it. It brings you latest breaking news about all aspects of natural health care from across the globe and, and latest breaking research so it totally keeps you up to date with everything that's going on in the field. Um, I also wanted just to tell you about the copyright notice, just one second, there we go. Feel free to borrow this copyright notice for your own work. Um, everything we do at CMA is copyright and our logo is a registered trademark. Use of it is only by written permission from the CMA. So um, you're allowed to use it if you're a member, of course, because membership has privileges. Okay, so I'm going to come out of this presentation and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to come back to we're going to come back to, uh, right, here we go, um, Zoom, that's where we are. Can I just ask you, uh, Roberta, I've got you there. Um, can you see me? Guys, uh, in fact, everybody, can I have a, a show of thumbs? Can you see me? Yeah, you can. Okay, that's fantastic. Great, because I've got books to show you. I know that I've, I've kept you for ages today, but it has been really, really important information. So, what I'm saying is, uh, we've got a great one here. Um, this is um, by some of the greatest names in uh, persuasion marketing. Noah Goldstein, Steve Martin, and Robert Cialdini. Uh, yes, 50 Secrets from the Science of Persuasion. That's a brilliant one for you to look at. Uh, let me just uh, take myself back to... Let me go back there. Okay. Right, yeah, there we go. Lovely. Um, the next one is this is very, this one is very academic, okay, um, but it's still an easy read and it's got quite, a, it's nicely laid out because this is by my man, Robert Cialdini. Uh, Cialdini used to be a um, social psychology lecturer at LSE. He's now um, gone back to America where he's heading up some psychology, social psychology, or oh, is it Arizona State University? Um, this is the man, this is the guy that literally wrote the book on um, influence, science and practice. Now I'm not talking about dirty psychological tricks, although if that's your bag, <laughs> far be it for me to comment. Um, this is a fantastic book, highly enjoyable. Um, this is really interesting, this is called Wired for Story by a lady called Lisa Cron. And um, it's the writer's guide to using brain science to hook readers from the very first sentence. It's called Wired for Story. Um, 
it's really fascinating. Um, it's a re once you get into it, I would say, yeah, you know, just just kind of persevere for the first bit where she's kind of setting it all out. Once you get through the first chapter, you're then on a roll. And then we cannot possibly leave this session without this book, the Bible. This is Ogilvy on advertising. This book is my bedtime reading. He literally, David Ogilvy, who set up Ogilvy and Mather, the world's largest advertising agency. Um, he literally has uh, created the most effective ads um, ever in existence, mostly print and a lot of TV ads, because of course the internet came along after David Ogilvy. Nevertheless, the principles are exactly the same because Ogilvy was the guy who understood that what you really have to do is provoke a visceral response in the people that you are actually advertising to. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm just going to ask uh, Roberta, are there any, um, let me just see if I can, uh, Roberta, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, Roberta, are there any questions that we need to answer at all? Uh, really just one, uh, your thoughts on Calibri as a font. I've just seen it. Yeah, actually, it's great uh, for me because I work on a Mac. Um, and so, for example, it, uh, Calibri tends to come up. It's, an, it's a sans serif font, everybody. So it comes up with no twiddly bits on it. So it's super, super easy to read on screen. It's quite nice. It's quite neat. I actually really like Calibri. Yes. OK. Uh, the only other thing I have said, if anyone wants specific details on the book to email me, so if anyone could do that, that would be great. Yeah. And there was nothing else. I have a list of the other webinars that people would probably like to do. So I think we're, we're good. Terrific, that's fantastic, Roberta. Thank you very much. I'm just looking through just to see if, uh, if I've missed anything. Thank you very much for your very kind comments, everybody. Um, uh, oh, let's have a little look. Uh, many thanks, these are great webinars. Will they com be combined into a Udemy course one day? I think they would be very useful for all marketers. Um, do you know, that's a, a wonderful idea. In fact, actually, what we have been talking about um, between ourselves at the CMA, because um, we are just going, going strength to strength and uh, some really amazing things have been happening. Um, not, in, not in least, thanks to obviously Roberta and Megan. Um, and of course, Megan, I don't know if you know, looks after the social media side of things, which has taken a massive load off my shoulders. So it does mean now that I'm actually more freed up to start to create courses for you. So um, yes, actually, we are looking at creating a practice development course um, and a general sort of marketing business course as well. Um, and I appreciate that while I'm giving you all of the uh, the nitty gritty and the, the bare bones and, and so on of everything you need to do. And I'm not holding back, I'm sharing all my knowledge because I truly believe that we gain by giving. And I'm sure because you're practitioners, I'm sure you'd feel exactly the same. But the thing that I think people would find most useful, let me know if this is actually correct for you, um, is that if I was to create essentially a blueprint so that I essentially stitch all of this together for you so that you can go through it module by module by module in a really logical fashion. Um, and what we would do is we would, it would be a chargeable course, but we would make it really unbelievably low priced for CMA members as, as part of your membership benefits. So we don't want to foist it on everybody because not everybody might particularly want to do a marketing course and a practice development course, but I think a lot of people would. So if that's something that appeals to you, then, you know, again, let us know about that as well. And if enough people would like it, we will get onto it for you. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you for um, doing everything, Roberta, and uh, keeping us all uh, under control. That's brilliant. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon, everybody. Thank you very, very much indeed for coming along. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye, Bye.